everybody and welcome to this week's reading vlog. A um, couple of things about this reading vlog you're about to see. Number one, apologies for the noise outside. We ended up getting about a foot of snow in April, the joys of North Dakota. So what can you do? So that's happening in the background. Number two, this reading vlog is actually, as you can tell, the reading chronicle for um, the Romance Takeover Buddy Read because I didn't feel like making two separate vlogs and I figured I would just like postpone starting my vlog until I started reading for the readathon. So it is Friday, April 3rd in the morning and I have a few updates already to give you. Here's what I want to First, I ended up finishing a book already. Um, I started this book at about 10 o'clock last night and I finished it this morning because I just couldn't wait. I'm an impatient person and I finished reading When She Said I Do by Celeste Bradley. Oh my gosh, I forgot how much I love this book because what had happened, I think I said this before, is that I read this book and then I read the second book in the series and I didn't really like the second one that much. And then I never just picked up any more in the series. I ended up getting rid of all my Celeste Bradley books because I didn't think I would reread them at the time. I was a completely different reader back then. Back then, Celeste's books were very like risque historical romance to me back when I was like 18 and 19. And I forgot that both this book and its sequel, I don't know about the rest of the series because I haven't read them, had bits of BDSM in them. And I completely forgot that. And I think part of the reason is that number one, especially in this book, it's really more just the submission part of it. Our heroine, um, the setup of this book, I think I said, is that um, it is kind of a Beauty and the Beast retelling where Calliope and her entire family, which there is nine children in this family, um, they are in an accident and the nearest home is this place called Avondale Manor. And the owner lives there alone. He is an injured hero who is just waiting to die because he's been told by doctors that he won't live because he's too messed up. He was run through with a pike. He was burned, he was tortured, and he's pretty crippled by this, and so he's just waiting to die, basically. And Calliope and her family end up inside his home because it's abandoned, and they are, you know, they were dumped in a river near his home, and she walks through the home, she starts a fire in there, she finds a room that is his treasure room basically, and she finds all these jewels and she's just stunned to see them just laying around in this house, and so she tries on a pearl necklace. This pearl necklace is three strands, it is hundreds of pearls, and she is wearing it. And um, Ren, who his name is Sir Lawrence Porter, comes in and he's half crazy because he's been starving himself, hasn't been sleeping well, he is um, a recluse, and he thinks that she is like a vision come to tempt him. So he gets a little bit handsy and Calliope is kind of like, oh my god, what's happening? And her brother comes in. And so then her brother challenges him to a duel and then Calliope is like, this is stupid when she realizes Mr. Porter wants to die. He's begging her brother to kill him. So she makes a bargain with him, which he, the night before, in his, you know, half-crazed mind said, um, what would you give me for each pearl that I let you keep? So she takes that as a bargain with him. And now we have this strange um, sexual bargain that's been made that neither one of them really meant to happen, but also both of them are pretty interested in. So uh, the deal is that since Ren thinks he's going to die, he promises Calliope that for each favor that she does him, he will give her one of the pearls back. And when she's earned all the pearls back, then she can leave and he's going to stay there and die. Well, holy crap, this book is good, guys, because that seems like a really messed up bargain, except for two things that make this not as coercive as it sounds. Number one, Calliope really loves everything that's happening. There's never any moment where, you know, the only reason she's going through with it is because he's giving her money even or giving her these pearls back. For her, it feels like freedom because 
this is a bargain. I'm supposed to want to do it. But he also would never stop her from leaving. She could just leave if she wanted to. But she doesn't. And so she starts earning the pearls back. And whenever he gives her a pearl, she will, he will tell her to take the pearl, close her eyes, put her hands behind her back, and not move. Now, at the time that I first read this book, I didn't, I had never read a single book about BDSM or power play or submission and dominance, not a single one. So this just seemed like a very fantastical, overly erotic historical romance. And it's not overly erotic when I read it now, but it was when I was 19. In fact, it is so beautiful because Calliope has been taking care of her entire family. Both of her parents are a little nutty and her siblings are always getting into trouble. Um, they're inventors and artists and they're just all a little bit loony and now Calliope is able to be in a place where the only one she has to worry about herself and when Ren is commanding her in these moments she feels so free. Now if that's not the setup for BDSM I don't know what is. It isn't taken to the full extent and I don't really think either one of them knows what it is about the situation that is getting them so excited. Um, and I think that that's clever how Celeste has done it because there's never a time where they're like, we need to sit down and figure out rules or go over these things. It's just a natural thing that the two of them have between them that they like to do. And so I just rereading it this time, I remembered all the things I liked about it. And then I have a new appreciation for it because I didn't understand why BDSM is so appealing or what people like about it until now. And so I'm completely loving it again. And the second book, which I already started, but I put aside because I'm trying to focus on the books for this one, is along And Then Came Marriage. And this is about Calliope's twin brothers, Castor and Pollux. And they both fall for the same woman. Um, and they end up kind of she doesn't know that they're twins. They didn't even purposely do this. They both met her independently and she thinks it's been the same person. And because they're twins, they're like, well, you have to give us each a chance to win you over individually. And so she agrees. And um, one of the twins is also into a power dynamic and Miranda really likes that um, as well. So I'm only part way into this one, but I stopped so that I could go back to my list and not just jump ahead in the series, but I definitely will be finishing that soon. So next up for reading for me, I want to start reading A Heart of Blood and Ashes by Mila Vane. Um, this is on both my April TBR and this romance TBR. This is a fantasy romance. I've already described it better in my um, both my April TBR and this romance TBR if you want to check that out. Um, but this is supposed to be kind of, this is supposed to be an enemies to lovers fantasy romance. There are people in kilts, there's dragons, seems exciting. The other book I will probably be reading off and on today is Black Veil, which is a new release by Kate Avery Ellison, and it's kind of a dystopian fantasy, um, Red Riding Hood retelling, uh, the Handmaid's Tale mixed in there. So very excited for that. So that is where we're at with the readathon so far, the buddy read so far, and I'll check back in with you later on. Hello, time for a check-in. <clears throat> so my reading has went super great today. Um, it is 9 p.m. and I have finished two more books. So I did finish Black Veil, which I'll be honest, drove me crazy for the first 60% of this one. Ugh. So here's the only thing that I'm complaining about because you know what? It ended up having a super great cliffhanger at the end. I'm very excited for the next one as I was for this one. But okay, so this author, she writes pretty short books. The All three in this one have been between um, 200 and 250 pages each, which um, she tends to put out very long series from what I've seen. And I just saw an update that this series will be at least five books, um, which is exciting. But it's also like I'm the type of person that I'd rather you give me three long books instead of five short ones, especially for the story that she's telling, because it felt like 
the first 60% of this book was filler. And not completely because I like that it was taking its time in certain aspects, but in other aspects, it was driving me freaking bonkers. It was driving me crazy, guys. I was going crazy. And I was honestly getting mad. And it's more so that she made it feel so much longer because she kept putting the characters in exactly the same situation over and over and over and over and over again. And really, I think three of those would have been fine or even two before we understood what was going on. And it just got frustrating for me. However, the way she did a couple of reveals and then how she finally escalated some of the tension, I was good with it. One other thing, though, ugh, this series, The Age of the Girl, this is definitely a new adult series, but the author's writing it like it's YA. And I've had YA books that have left me less sexually frustrated than this lady is. I'm just being honest with you. The girl just needs to make it happen, and I'm getting annoyed. And if I don't get some sexy time in one of the next books, I'm going to have to stop recommending the series. I'm just saying. Tension, and she's not doing anything with it, and it's pissing me off. Mm. Anyway, then I finished Misconduct by Penelope Douglas, which somehow I've owned for two years and haven't read yet, because I bought it when I first was getting into Penelope Douglas, and I didn't read it and honestly okay so it's not my favorite one but it was really good and it isn't as taboo of a uh age gap as a couple other ones she's done it's not even as taboo as like anything else and that's probably why this is one of her only um mainstream um published like this was traditionally published by an offshoot of Penguin Random House. And this is about a woman named Easton. She's 23 years old, just starting off in her teaching career. And a couple months before she got this job, she met this guy at a, a fundraising event and then never saw him again. Or it was a Mardi Gras event, but it was classy. It was a thing. And then she meets him at a parent-teacher conference. And he is the parent of one of her students. And so he's 35, she's 23, 12-year age difference, which is pretty decent amount. But also for the kind of woman Easton is, like she feels a lot more adult. So it's more taboo because he is her uh, student's parent than for the age gap part of it. But he also is running for senator, so he needs to keep his image together. And it was pretty hot. I ended up giving it four stars just because some of the other stuff going on was kind of random, but I think I liked it. Maybe it's like a 4.25 because like four feels kind of low, but it was good. It was fun and it was great. So next, as I had said this before, I'm going to try to dive into this. I ended up changing my mind because I wanted to read a contemporary after reading the fantasy that I just read or this dystopian fantasy, whatever. So now I'm going to start that one. And that'll just leave that I'm halfway done. <laughs> but I did end up reading another book in between as well, which I didn't tell you about. And that's Big Man by uh, Penny Wilder, which I'll tell you about later on. So, bye! Hey guys, just popping in with a quick clip here. So it is Saturday morning, or I mean, I guess it's afternoon now. And everything's going pretty good. Um, I'm actually probably going to take a nap right now, which is kind of random. But I had a headache when I went to bed last night. And it just didn't really go away. But I got up at like 9 today after sleeping in a little bit. And I did all my cleaning. And I went and picked up a couple groceries. And then I was going to sit down to read A Heart of Blood and Ashes. And here's the thing. I so want to read that book. That book is on my April TBR already. Um, and I'll probably still end up starting it. But whew, there are so many characters and political situations and things introduced in the first chapter of that book that I was very confused. So I looked up a couple reviews for it. 
and they were all really positive, but they all say that this is a very high fantasy, fantasy romance. So it's high on the fantasy. Like this person didn't, just didn't pick an easy fantasy and then throw a romance in it. She's setting up a very intense um, fantasy series. And so I don't want to just rush through that series when I'm in the mood for a romance because that's what I want to read right now. I want to read quick and dirty, fun romance. And that one is going to be number one, pretty emotionally taxing as well as I need to be sharp. I need to pay attention. So, um, while I'll probably start it this weekend still, I wanted to read some more fun, quicker ones. So I started the Bromance Book Club as my book today. I'm already over 100 pages in. It's going really fast. Um, it's pretty cute. Um, it's very... I like um, second chance romances when they are a married couple. Um, that's something I really enjoy. So I'm really liking this one because it's about this baseball player who finds out that his wife has been faking orgasms for the last three years when they have sex this one night and she actually has one and then he realizes they've been fake and so he's a little bit upset about it and his friends decide to invite him into their book club where they learn about women by reading romances and I loved the premise when I heard about this. I love the idea of it. There's already a second one out in here and there will be a third. And yeah, so it's everything that I'm like hoping it's going to be. Um, Gavin is like, he's a great guy. He just, he overreacted when he found that out. He felt, you know, like his manhood was questioned. He, you know, and his wife is like, we have much bigger issues going on because the reason that that's not happening for me with you is because I don't trust you and because I don't feel like you see me. And he is slowly coming around to the idea that the books that he's reading will help him. And I'm at the part of the book now where he's kind of made a deal with her that she'll give him one month to like win him over. Um, otherwise, he will give her everything she wants in the divorce and not like fight for anything. So he puts it all on the line and I love it. I love that. So yeah, I really, I really like stuff like this. So anyway, it's gonna be fun. Hi guys. It is Sunday at about noon right now. Um, my reading is going to be coming to the end for now. I'm about to head to my friend's house for the day and I probably won't get any more done and I want to get this edited and put up and if I wait till the end of the night I know that I won't do that so um, make sure that you guys join our live show which will be tonight um, this is this video is gonna go up on tomorrow which is Monday and our live show is gonna be at 7 p.m. central on always booked channel um, she's a smaller channel, so make sure you check out um, our hashtag and you'll probably find your way to that. So I ended up reading six books in two and a half days. And the only one that I missed from my TBR was A Heart of Blood and Ashes. And I think I said in the last clip, like, I really want to be able to devote enough time to that book because I don't I didn't just want to rush through it to get it done and that's what would have ended up happening because there's so much information it's a high fantasy I need to be able to pay attention so the only group that I ended up not doing one in was paranormal but I would technically say that black veil fit in both dystopian sci-fi and paranormal because there's werewolves in black veil so yeah but let's go ahead and like wrap up what i read so the first book that i read was when she said i do and i already gushed profusely about this book um i gave it five stars it was even better than i remembered it because i better understand it now and i enjoyed it so 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 much um in the last two weeks, I've read so many historical romance. I am fully in a historical romance binge, so you will definitely be seeing some more content from me soon. I just need to put my thoughts together and determine which kind of videos I want to do. I'll definitely be doing some recommendation videos and probably another discussion video as well 
is what I'm kind of feeling. So that will be happening very soon. Um, well, I didn't read this one right after, but we'll talk about this. So then I read the sequel. I finished this one last night. Um, and this one is the second one in the Wicked Worthingtons called And Then Comes Marriage. And this was another one that I have read before. But again, it was really like intense to me at the time because I didn't understand BDSM at all. And I didn't realize that's what was going on because I was a naive 18 year old and just had never read anything um, specifically anything this subtle so it just seemed kind of like weird and now reading it like I remember me and my sister both read it and my sister was like I can't keep reading this because I don't under like it's too much for me and I know now she would probably appreciate it more too because it's actually done really beautifully and we both like understand that more she still doesn't like reading like hardcore stuff the way that I will but I feel like if she reread this one now, it wouldn't have seemed so intense as it did back then. But this one is about um, the twin Worthingtons. Their names are Castor and Pollux. And they incidentally end up falling for the same woman. And it happens completely accidentally, but the woman thinks she's only meeting one person. And so when one of the twins sees his brother coming out of her house, he freaks out and he's like, how could you do this to her? How could you trick her? And he's like, what are you talking about? I thought we had an instant connection. And he's like, uh, yeah, because I've been seeing her for a month already. And so because they love each other so much and they never want to be in competition, they go and present themselves to Miranda and they say, you have to date both of us and decide who you like more. And she's like, but I thought I was dating Paul and he's the only one I want to date. And they're like, sorry, you haven't given the other guy a chance and we can't have there be jealousy. So it's a little bit of a like, I call bullshit on the idea that she would have to do that. But because it's a, you know, it's a story, they do. And it becomes clear that Cass is actually the brother that she has a deeper connection with and that kind of gets confusing for her because there's kind of this like darker connection that they have which is that BDSM element that I said but it's mostly just showed in the dominant submission part of it which is usually what you see in softer versions of BDSM but it was so good was so good and it made me cry because I just loved the brotherly love that was somehow in here and this didn't go in any weird way like this isn't there's no like menage situation happening or anything there are two very clearly different guys courting this woman and it was really beautiful I really liked it and now I can start on the third one which all the rest of the series I haven't read yet and it's exciting because the brother who doesn't get picked um his book is still to come out because I was worried about that, um, that the rest of the series, because she's kind of taking a while to get this whole series out. But this series has potential to be as awesome as a Bridgerton series, so just saying. So then I read Black Veil, which I talked about a lot, and this was a little bit hard for me because the author, every, this is the third book in the series, and I really thought the momentum was building up at the end of the second one and then again we like hit our brakes and everything like slowed down and it was just like a drag and these books are short you know these books of hers they're under 300 pages and the story that she's telling like it was oh it was getting frustrating and then at finally at 65% because I checked finally we start to escalate things quicker and I know that when this whole series is done, I'm going to appreciate the time she took to build this up. And I understand that. But I'm telling you, the slow burn that's happening, ugh, it's killing me. And also because these characters are older and it's definitely a new adult age, but she's writing it like YA for the chasteness. And I just don't want it. I want some dirty sex to happen and it isn't happening. And I'm getting frustrated but I ended up giving this still a four I think I gave it a four or 4.25 because 
man, it's going to be good overall. I'm just feeling really sexually frustrated when I read it. But the twist that this lady comes up with, you feel like she's just meandering. Like I was like, what are you doing? You're taking too long. And then she explains it. And I was like, oh, that's what you were doing. I should trust you by now because the woman's good. She's good. So now the next one is White Mask, and that doesn't come out until October. And now again, we wait. But it was very enjoyable. And again, the first one in this is Red Rider. I heard some of you say you're interested in the series. Please don't take my pessimism as a reason not to watch it. I think a lot of you who don't like as much sex will really like this series. And again, I still liked it. It's just that I like smut. And so there wasn't enough. But it's still very tension-filled and like sexy in the way, you know, of like the tension. So it's still beautiful. I'm just, I'm a hoe. So there you go. Then I read Misconduct by Penelope Douglas and this was fun. This is her, I believe, only traditionally published book by Penguin Random House. This is an age gap contemporary romance. It is between a teacher, a young teacher, she's 23, and one of her student's parents, who he's 35, and he's going, he's going to run to be a senator, and he is kind of controlling and obnoxious, and they end up meeting before the school year starts, um, so, you know, they have this instant connection, but they, she learns what his name is, but he only knows her first name, and then when he shows up for, um, you know, open house, with his son, he realizes who she is, and then they're left kind of fighting their connection with each other. But Easton, she has some baggage in her past, which most Penelope Douglas characters do, where she has some OCD and like counting issues where she likes to count when she's stressed. Her and her brother had lost their parents a couple years ago. She had been stalked by a certain person in her life, and so that is some damage she has. Um, so she's a very closed off person. And um, Tyler, he just wants to bust it all down. But Tyler is dealing with some of his own issues where he's trying to reconnect with his son after not putting in enough effort when his son was young because, you know, he's only 35 and has a 14 year old son and he didn't care about being a dad. And he just threw money at the woman who had him and, you know, missed out on that connection that he's now regretting. So um, there's that conflict being in there as well. So it was great. Then I read The Bromance Book Club, which was so adorable. So I've seen people say they like the second one a lot better, which, I mean, I'm excited to get to the next book. But here's the thing, too. I see a lot in the booktube community that people don't love as much a second chance with a married couple. So plenty of people like a second chance romance if people liked each other when they were young or they have a bad first impression or something. But when it's a married couple who's having marital issues, they don't always like when it gets fixed. And that's just something I'm noticing because I see a lot of the reasoning why people didn't like it that they just either don't believe that a married couple could fix this, or they're just not as intrigued about it. Well, I love this. So we have Gavin Scott, and he finds out one night, I know I've already wanted this, but he finds out one night that his wife hasn't been orgasming with him their entire marriage. She used to before they got married, but she hasn't in three years. And he discovers that she did because she does, during kind of a drunken sex one night and he's like oh my god you've been faking it and she's like well how did it take you so long to know and he freaks out because he's insecure um because of some other things in his life like you wouldn't think he'd be insecure he's a baseball player he's very popular he's very handsome but he has always had sexual insecurities and so to find out that the woman he loves has been lying to him it hurts him but he realizes that he's messed up and he wants to fix it. And some of his friends have a romance book club, which isn't called this at the beginning of the book, by the way, which I didn't know that. 
and they explain to him that there are things you can learn from romances to help you be a better husband and lover and friend which I think we as women like all know that because romance novels are fantasies written by women and so they're not saying that they are like a perfect like if you do this you will perfectly get the woman they're just saying like you can learn how to pay attention to her and how to communicate and how to love her best if you will pay attention to these books and so he enters into a deal with his wife where she will give him one month to try to win her back um and if she can't, or if he can't win her back, then he will give up the house. He won't, he'll let her choose the custody arrangement and he'll give her as much money as she wants. And so it's a, it's a winner take all situation, high stakes. And it is beautiful because I love, I love a fresh romance where the first blush of love is coming about someone. But I love when you have a marriage and you have two people who really care and they fight for it. Um, and I've told you this before, like my own parents, they literally got divorced and then remarried each other 18 months later because they realized they messed up and they wanted to try again. And so I'm all in on married people fixing it because I don't believe in there being one perfect person for you, but I believe that when you choose your person, you make it work. So I loved this. I gave it five stars. It was adorable. And then the last book I read was Married in the Morning by Lisa Kleypas. And this is the fourth book in the Hathaway series, which before I started the readathon this weekend, I have read the other three books in this series. I, like I said, I've been on a romance binge and I have ordered the physical copy of the fourth book, but it got delayed in getting delivered. And I was just like, fuck it, excuse my language. And so I purchased it on Kindle and I read it last night. And this book is, um, I'm actually gonna be doing a review of the whole series when I finish the last book, so I won't go too much into it. But this book is about the oldest brother in the family finally, and I've been waiting to read that one for a while, so I'm very excited. And he has had this antagonistic relationship with his sister's um, like companion, who she was first their governess kind of, and now she's a companion to the youngest sister. And he's always had this antagonist relationship with her. And so we've been watching it for the last three books. And you just knew, like you just knew that there was sexual tension in there. And the line of the last book, he came into her room and said, we need to talk about what happened. And so you were like, ah! what did we miss happen and so this book is about um he finds out that there's a clause in the will of the place that they've been staying at the house they've been living in the last four years he can only keep it if he gets married and has an heir within the next year which it was supposed to be the first five years and he's only finding about it now so there's someone waiting to take their home away basically which is stupid and i've never heard of a clause like that before but it makes for a good book. And so he either needs to find a bride or lose their home. And luckily there's some feelings going on with, with the governess and it's so good. Oh my God. So this was kind of a hate to love and it was so sexy. Lisa Klepez, guys, she is quickly, quickly becoming my favorite. Um, and I never thought I'd say that, but like Julia Quinn is very wholesome in a lot of her books. And I adore that. Like I will always love her. You know that. But the more time I spend with Lisa, the more time I'm like, you're my queen. Because she has that extra sexiness in her books that I just love. Because I love my historical romance and I love all the fun of it. But I love the sexiness of a contemporary where they get a little dirty. And she just does that. She does that. And it's so perfect. So there you go. So guys, those are the books that I got through this weekend. Um, got through six of these. How many did you get through? Um, which was your favorite read? I mean, for me, it's probably the Bromance Book Club. I loved the historicals. I don't know. When she said I do was really good as well. It's really hard to choose, but let me know what your thoughts were. Uh, make sure you subscribe and click the bell for, um, uh, notifications when I upload, um, and have a wonderful day. Bye.